question form. Go behind the Iron Curtain USA. Cold War. I was drafted in 1962 at, during the Missile Crisis in Cuba, and uh, that was a tough period of time. Missiles in Cuba, missiles pointing at each other, 30,000 the Soviets had. But what did they do? They actually, you know, Kennedy actually talked to Khrushchev and said, hey, you know, maybe we ought to back down. Neither one of us could do needs a nuclear exchange. So they backed down, but they talked to each other. We refused to even talk to the Iranians. Possibly we could work something out, but this whole idea that we have to bomb and declare war and go to war against the Iranians doesn't make any sense at all, and it jeopardizes it. about this, this choice. One, we give them a lot of money. The other one, we send them bombs. But in, uh, in, in Pakistan, actually, there's a third option that we've looked at. We uh, are allies, so to speak, with the Pakistani government. We give them a lot of money, billions of dollars. At the same time, we're dropping missiles and bombs on them continuously. So we do both to them. So it's time that we just look for this other option, and that is getting along with people in a lot different way. Just think of how much better things are with Vietnam. During the 60s, when I was in the service, we had the Vietnam War going on. What a tragedy. 60,000 Americans killed. The French had been there 10 years. We were there another 10 years. A million Vietnamese died. So we, we lose the war, we leave, and the reason we were there was to stop the domino effect of communism. Well, where are the communists now? It's a failed system. The Soviet system collapsed, the Chinese had become our bankers, and we trade with Vietnam. <laughs> Pretty good evidence that a lot more can be achieved in peace than in war. Washington, as it is in the medical care, what is the degree that the government should be involved? But in foreign, foreign policy, this is the same thing. There's a big debate going on. But if they don't change policy, they say, which country should we invade next? Yeah. You know, and, and, and just uh, pick and choose. But they endorse this whole concept of interventionism. But the whole idea of trying to write us off as, uh, as, as being isolationists, I think it's time now that this Cold War is over. Don't you think it's about time we started trading with Cuba and traveling back and forth with Cuba? of additional debt because of the wars that have been going on. So not only is it a moral issue and a constitutional issue, it's obviously an economic issue. We didn't have to fight the Soviets. They collapsed because they had a failed uh, economic system. But just think of what the difference would be in this country as far as prosperity and, and uh, the wealth of the middle class and the ability to take care of sick people and education, all these things. What if we would have only had people in Washington, D.C. who actually had read the Constitution and followed the Constitution? is not too tip difficult to read and understand and it's very precise on how we go to war and who makes the decision. You go to war when it's declared. You don't go to war at the whims of a president or an administration. The war is declared and that is by the people going through their uh, representatives. But 
when uh, the Secretary of Defense, Panetta, was asked the other day, where do you get this authority? You're getting ready, you know, you're in Libya, and we're in all these countries, where do you get this authority? He says, you get it from the international governments. You get it from the United Nations, or NATO. That is the giving up of, the, of national sovereignty and deferring to even bigger governments. We have enough problems worrying about how big the federal government is, intrusive in our state governments and our local governments. We don't need another level of government, a higher up in the United Nations. And the You know, meager proposals for the budget in the first year is to cut a trillion dollars. You know that. And that, makes, that makes a lot of people nervous, and they said, "Well, oh, yes, but what if all these troops come home? Won't that increase the unemployment?" And uh, cutting this money, I said, "No. If you cut a trillion dollars out of the budget and you bring your troops home, guess what? That money gets spent here at home." <laughs> to look at statistically is what happened after World War II. Uh, there were 10 million in the military and they wanted out of the war. It was over and done with. When the war was declared, it was won and it was expected that the men and women would come home and get out of the service. They hit 10 million. And the uh, Keynesian economists were wringing their hands and they said, oh, this will be terrible. They'll all be unemployment. We have to have jobs programs and all this. Well, they came home so quickly, they didn't have time to organize another jobs programs that they had going uh, in the 30s. So guess what happened? The spending was cut by 60%. Taxes went down 30%. And all of a sudden, the depression ended. still hear it at times is that if you have a if you have a recession that you foolishly turn it into a depression that we seem to be working on right now that the ultimate way you get out of depressions is you have a war and their argument is well everybody's employed sure everybody's employed but they're getting shot at and they're getting killed that's a heck of a way to kind of cut down your unemployment rate <laughs> what you need to have full employment is to get the government off our backs and out of our wallets and out of our lives and let